What? You can't play war games in the pool. You can't. Bits get wet. So, just finished, and I'm going to say one time, uh, a, a scenario of uh, Tenkaiotsu from Hexasim. And in particular, we played the Battle of uh, Sekigahara again, and had a thoroughly, thoroughly good time. Really seems to me, as I've mentioned a couple of times before, that the French companies and some of the smaller independents are really capturing the quality, gameplay, and interesting battle nexus. They're pulling it all together and, whoops, I knocked over my drink, and, uh, and pulling it all together and making some really great games. And uh, this uh, Tenkaiotsu is, is no exception to that rule. So, what I thought I'd do, since I'm in the pool, and I just finished, and I really wanted to, I literally got home just half an hour ago, and the game's been replaying in my mind, and I was talking to Pete Attack, who I played with, and this was our second play together, and, you know, in fairness, uh, Pete was a great uh, guide, <laughs> because he really helped me uh, remember the rules, which is good, because uh, I was not prepared very well at all. I had a good general appreciation for the system and a good general appreciation for what I, my plan was going to be in terms of, you know, how I was going to approach the game, I thought. But there was a lot of niggling detail in that game that I had forgotten about and, and you know, procedural things that were that I probably should have had my head around before I turned up to play. So kind of let the, let the team down there a little bit, but it, it didn't affect the, the gameplay or the game pace, the pace of the gameplay either that much. So uh, it was a, I'll call it a solid victory for the Tokugawa faction. Uh, this time around, we played a much more patient, slow-paced game. Uh, the the game the game. Uh, so if you know anything about the Battle of Sekihara, set in 1600, it's a feudal Japanese title uh, battle, and uh, the title. Uh, that has four battles in it, and Sekigahara is probably one of the larger battles in the in the game. So there's a fair few pieces, and there's lots and lots of clans, uh, some who are loyal uh, or more or less loyal to one side or the other, and can be influenced or switched. And so that plays into the uh, tactical considerations, and you spend basically VPs in pledges to these these uh, these soldiers or these these uh, shoguns of these smaller clans, right? And daimos of these smaller clans. And so having that dynamic in a tactical game where we're at 250 meter hexes on gorgeous maps and big beautiful counters with all the mons for the individual uh, clans was fantastic. That layer of almost political intrigue, I want to call it, was very, very cool. So, so as we approached this game this time, we both took our time trying to let the loyalty and fealty decision-making play itself out a little more, uh, a little more completely than we did the first time. First time we both kind of went, hey, let's see how combat works. And we just went at it. And don't do that because combat can be a bad thing for both sides all the time. Uh, I really, I, I have forgotten how bad it could be. You can be winning in combat and lose your ass and lose your entire clan because of the fact that, you know, this impetuosity that these guys had when they won, they advanced. And when you're under attack orders, bad things happen. So, you know, if I was ever going to play again, there would be some different things I would do tactically with orders to mitigate that sort of, uh, uh, that, that kind of crazy, uh, nice hair, hey? uh, uh, that crazy kind of uh, continual battle thing going on because your, your forces just kind of, if you're in, under attack orders, just go and they start spreading out because they have to attack, they have to advance to attack. 
so I'm kind of jumping all over the place a little bit here. I'm only five minutes into it. Let me say this, and I'm hopefully I'll put some pictures up into this video so that you can get a view of what went on across the eight or nine turns that we played. But the two forces start basically opposed to each other with Ishida up on a hill to one side, surrounded by a pretty pretty weak ass kind of uh, defensive formation. And Tokugawa is set back in the middle of the field with three large, strong, high mass formations. And we'll talk about mass and Elan in a minute. But, uh, and then there's a, a sort of an, a, a crescent of forces around uh, Tokugawa, set some distance off, facing off against the Shida's forces. But one, two, three sets of, three, maybe four sets of forces are undecided as to which side they're going to fight for be on Ashida's side. And then behind Tokugawa is, a, is uh, three more sets of forces, one which is quite substantial, that are really looking to you know come in from behind and flank uh, Tokugawa and mess him up pretty badly. So you're trying to, as Tokugawa and Ashida, you're trying to influence these these forces and, and pull chits and move them on a loyalty track over to your side. Tokugawa can influence that more distinctively by paying VPs that are used if a certain something happens, a certain uh, delta on the VP track occurs at the end of the game. So I spent 15 VPs, which is substantial, uh, to move the pledge levels up and get extra chits put in the bucket so that I could have higher chances of pulling stuff out. So I was trying to do a slow rolling start combat to get into this 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 battle, uh, this Sekigahara battle, and letting these these loyalty things play out. And well, chits just weren't coming my way, and so uh, uh, as I was maneuvering, I started pushing more and more forces to the north to protect myself from a very heavy force that if it did come. Uh, onto Ishida's side and launch itself, it was going to be game over for me because that's what happened last time. And uh, so I, I, I pushed a lot more forces up to the north, let's call it the north, until the top of the map uh, this time. And that ended up playing to my benefit because as the, as the chits start to normalize on the pulls, the loyalty started sliding my way a little bit and then uh, the opponent, Pete, saw that that was happening he's like oh man well this i need to get in there and start scoring some vps by killing units and units have two factors on them they have elan uh, which is somewhere between zero and two and they have mass which can be somewhere between one and four and typically two well there are some one ones but anyway and those two factors play into the combat capability of any given set of units and so he started attacking and attacking units that had Elan because every unit that you kill that has Elan, you get the Elan points as VPs. And so he was you know, racking up some kills and knocking uh, you know, my socks off here and there and I was starting to get a little bit worried. So I started to push in uh, on the north against some of these other weaker units and thought, heck with this loyalty stuff, I'll just go for it. So uh, I started attacking, got some good rolls started to roll up his northernmost, uh, the opposite flank to Ishida, and started to cause a little bit of problems for him. Of course, because I wasn't prepared, deeper reading of the rules would have helped me realize that it would have been more beneficial for me to, deep, uh, to attack more aggressively in the south near Ishida, because if you can knock out Ishida's bodyguard and uh, some other units nearby, you can get auto victory. But I think that uh, that approach kind of A, screwed with Pete a little bit and B, uh, forced him to, to, to get into the game a little more aggressively. So once I got to the point where one of these formations, uh, reinforcement group R, let's just call it the R clan, uh, they came over to my side. And so they were going to be coming on in two turns. I, rotate, I, I redeployed them. So that was now going to give me a significant advantage on the battlefield because the guy with the most units on the board wins at the end if we if we get to counting up VPs 
net of alarm points that you you pick up and all this sort of other stuff. So the so that was quite a fascinating game. There's a lot of to and fro and backwards and forwards and. Uh, you set yourself up with these orders. You're either moving, attacking, uh, uh, deploy, um, redeploying, which is basically uh, recovering morale and stuff like that, or withdrawing, I think, is the fourth command type. So when you get into combat, it's a pretty straightforward concept. It depends on what your orders are versus what the, uh, the defender's orders are. And based on that, you're going to add or subtract Elan or Malay or Mass uh, ratings from a 2d6 die roll but you roll 2d6 with blue dice and 2d6 with red dice and then you cross-reference those numbers and it is a fascinating set of swings that go on because by the time you uh, add in a few drms for the you know the the the, the attacks all have names so like uh, Renchen is the where we're both in just in Malay and so you're kind of static and fighting that can cause challenges right you have you, you you're, you're both adding up uh, your Malay and your Alan and then netting them out or then you subtract losses and all that sort of stuff but if you're charging into attack against someone who's moving then you're going to get a plus two on your die roll plus your alarm and your melee uh, your mass or and the enemy is not going to get their alarm so there's all these these deltas that factor into what will happen and you think well that could be pretty easy to work out when you look at this table you can kind of you know guesstimate what will happen but ends up that doesn't necessarily work out that way because of these die roll spreads and these different types of combat you're not always in control of when you're attacking because it is a chip pull uh, game. So you have activations for, here's a horse fly that's gonna bite me, great. Uh, so, and so you'll see me be a girly man in about 30 seconds when it lands on me because I hate those freaking things. Uh, I can hear it. <laughs> so you have these formations that you have to um, buy chits for with your command points and then you have uh, combat chit movement chit and a combat chit for the enemy and a rally chit and an initiative chit and when the combat chit comes out if you're adjacent to somebody you're fighting uh, when your formation is activated and it is the attack the attack formation uh, sorry uh, you're in the attack orders you have to advance to attack up to three movement points when you're in the combat uh, formation, uh, combat formation. When you're in the com under the combat chit in an attack formation, same deal. So you could have killed some guys, done a great job, and then you say, "Okay, now I want to uh, chill out." Well, if you haven't, if your chit hasn't been pulled for that formation, and you haven't been able to change the command to defense or move or something different, you're attacking. And so I ended up with one formation, kind of all the way in the middle, like hacking and slashing its way through uh, his weaker units. And finally they were surrounded and massacred. It was horrible. So you lose a lot of control once the battle starts, which to me makes a lot of sense because that's kind of how those battles unfolded, right? Things just got totally out of hand. Excuse me. So that could be lemonade. Or it could be a margarita. I'm not sure. So we had a fantastic time with this game. Uh, we did not use, there are some uh, some other optional rules in the game for attack formations that we didn't use because I wasn't really prepared to run with it. And I think they add an extra layer of subtlety to the game as well because you can actually force the enemy to attack you. Uh, you can force the enemy to withdraw at a certain time. There's all different things that can that can happen because of the way these they're basically battle plans and attack plans. So you know you've got the the flying crane and the ducking dove and the quacking this and you uh, you know the crying sparrow and you uh, you choose all these different battle formations and off you go and you you run uh, you you run these offenses. So if you ever played Rome Total War Shogun. 
it's exactly like that. You, you, when you choose an attack formation in Shogun, it, it reformats your guys into a certain format, a certain formation, and then that's going to give you, over a course of a number of turns, a certain number of attacks or movements or whatever the case may be. So very, very cool. We didn't get to that. I think we'll do that next time for sure, and I'll be ready to, uh, to actually be prepared for that. So I would highly recommend this game if you have an interest in the, the medieval period, uh, it's kind of almost a renaissance period, but it's really medieval for Japanese, but uh, 1600 era, all around that time scale, there's two titles out from them, there's a third coming. This particular title has four battles in it, and I think Kawane Kojima has two battles in it, I want to say, I haven't played that one yet. and. They're really, really cool games. Great packaging, great counters, great art, really well-structured rules, 22 pages of rules, and realistically, if they formatted those rules differently, it'd probably be 12 pages of rules because there's lots of white space on the pages and lots of examples down kind of a, a, a third column on one side or a, a second column, basically. There's a blank column, text, and then uh, notes and, and uh, diagrams on the, on the right-hand side. So lots of white space that uh, I really think would make it a, probably a 12 to 16 page rule book. Thoroughly enjoyable. We started at uh, probably 10.30, quarter to 11. We wrapped up at maybe four. We got eight plus turns done, I think about eight turns. And took took some breaks, took you know a lot of chit chat time as well. So very, very good game. Uh, thoroughly immersive and thematic and somewhat frustrating uh, uh, combat resolution system when you think you know you think you, you've got somebody because uh, a couple of times I think we rolled we almost had like we had a vassal die roller in our hands it was like the vassal die roller from hell where you pick up four dice and roll two sets of box cars that happened three times across about a hundred die rolls uh, sets of die rolls which is kind of crazy and you're thinking oh I've rolled double box cars I'm gonna slaughter these guys it's gonna be awesome automatic defender eliminated no because you've got a LAN, a mass, some DRMs, and you're moving columns up and down and sideways as you go, and you're gonna adjust, and you adjust to these really annoying things where you're one number off getting a kill or getting a, a, a proper result. Fascinating game. Uh, I'm waxing lyrical about it right now because I, I'm disappointed I haven't played it more and I really have to get the game out and play it solo. I've only played it opposed, and I think it would be great solo as well because it uh, it is a chip pool game. Um, so there you have it. I'm gonna go have a little swim and drink my drink and sit in that little floaty right there, and I'll talk to you guys later.